In your inquiry you connected rights with a specific anthropology and an underlying synthetic geometry. For example you mentioned the approach to rights in Rothbard and Hopp with the following words. The claim for universal rights in the rothbard hop approach came not out of nothing but was based on its implicit anthropology. As such, Rothbard stated that individuals possessed rights not because we felt that they should, but because of a rational inquiry into the nature of man and the universe. Hello. Yes, that's right. I consider it very important to understand that it is not the same to search for the foundation of rights in feelings and perception or in a formal inquiry. But why did they feel that individuals should possess rights? Isn't it the result of the rational inquiry? What are the implications of the difference? Precisely not. Look, we could distinguish these two approaches roughly, either as empirical or formal approach. On the one side, the empirical approach deduces rights from the feeling of a bad cautious as a result of certain actions. This might be due to psychological reasons. For example, if you have a strong need to be loved or admired by others, and you perceive after a certain action the withdrawal of, your, of their attention, you might learn that your action was not right. Or else, if you have a very placid and quiet behavior and for some reason you suddenly get brutish and loud, you might feel uncomfortable, as if it was not you acting at that moment. Most strongly, we are conditioned to the corrections by and the imitation of relatives, our social group or even the larger society. Most strongly, we are conditioned to the corrections by and the imitation of relatives or so our social group or even the larger society. These habits, if opposed, make us feel bad, as if we were not fully part of that group. This at times leads to a whole legal system as in the case of the English common law. On the other side, the formal approach establishes logical relations among objects which are deduced from the recognition of universal laws understood as independent from those objects. I have to insist here that this distinction is made by Rothbard and does not fully apply to my own approach. Strictly speaking, the conception of rights in my book is neither empirical nor formal, but performative. As such, I do not recognize any universal rights in the material sense, but only the universal principle of the constituency of rights, which is Schweitzer's reverence for life. What do you mean by this? Well. Simply, it would not be possible to claim this universal right to life in the most universal case. For we would have to claim against life itself, or God, the very day our own life ends. That was something I always wondered, why people apparently did not bother about this inconsistency. This comes probably from the Lockean defensive approach to rights, where rights are used as a tool to protect or defend one's interests. But my inquiry was, was much more interested in the question why the person existed at all and how it came about. Further, I did not believe that people only gathered for the sole reason to protect themselves from external threats or to keep the other in check. But let me define better what the distinction of this different approach is before explaining the per performative approach. You're welcome. Go on. Rothbard and Hoppe based their theory of rights on the natural rights approach. Deontic, 
and universal moral rights. These were understood as objective, independent from individual experience, while the right holders were strictly the individuals only. Interestingly, they derived liberty rights from a claim right, namely the duty of others towards the right holder to use only non-violent means in argumentation and analog also in life. Their liberty right to live was therefore derived from the claim right not to kill. Within their understanding of rights, there was thus the positive right to live and the negative to abstain from assisting others. It means that even though you have the right to live, nobody is obliged to help you when you are dying. So this could explain why there is a universal right to live, since de death is understood as something that simply happens to you, without the implication of any other, not even a god or some other authority. Rights for Rothbard and Hoppe had a very specific function. They served as a problem-solving tool, foremost in order to solve conflicts in human interaction and to find truth. Okay. Now, there are many possible alternatives, but probably the most contrary and widest extended one is the one of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was based on the idea of the four freedoms addressed by Roosevelt in 1941, including the freedom from wants and fear. Their approach is based on a contractual agreement which emerged from the general feelings or conceptions of what would promote peace after World War II. Of course, the whole project was and is much more complex I try to simplify in terms of exemplification, all right? Don't worry, go ahead. Well, these rights were not objective but subjectively based on the social context and are discussed continuously in order to include new rights where it feels required. Further, their application is also collective. For example, the very concept genocide implies that According this, not only individual humans have the right of protection, but also ethnic, racial, religious, cultural or national groups. This was established since 1944 when Raphael Lemkin coined the term. But its central idea goes even back to the Peace of Westphalia 300 years earlier in 1648 Europe. What is most central is that if it seems to include a claim right, the duty of others to protect a person in threat. This could be derived from the negative right not to fear and want. However, this aspect is still very controversial. In any case, rights in this context are also considered a tool for problem solving. Foremost, to solve conflicts of the war. As for the question of rights, I myself rely strongly in, on Niels Christie. It would be difficult to say if it is a natural or a contractual law because the understanding of law itself is different. It is also subjective and individual as in the case of Rothbard Hoppe approach but it is only based on the liberty right, the permission to live. This is based on a natural law theory, but anything beyond belongs to contractual laws, perhaps not strictly speaking legal laws. Law is not so much an institution than a principle and a practice for Christie. It results from a su successful negotiation of conflicts in direct interpersonal encounter, similar to what is described by Pedro Lain and Tralgo. As such, its function is constitutive for the individual and society. The practice of lawmaking might have not only a restitutive but also a resilient function. 
Let's review a comparison. Rights must be defined according their foundation, the measurements, the entitled person, derived applications and procedures, and its function. The social system is directly connected to the understanding of rights. Whereas the main approach of the contractualist is defined as a state of law, the state, Hoppe claimed for a kind of covenant community which was exclusive and could be closed up against others. In contrast, I promote the idea of a transcendental community where borders are open and rules are constantly renegotiated. So the constitution is directly derived from conceptions of rights. Is it that what you want to say? We could say so, even though I would explain the order the other way around. Anyways, it is an inter interdependent and interrelated process. When we start with a worldview on the concept of personhood, we can also define the relation among persons and between persons and objects and the law. This explains the origin of rights and how they can be validated. It is how actions can be defined as rightful or wrong. Rothbard and Hoppe started from a definition of man as the isolated individual. They use often the example of the literary figure Robinson Crusoe. Natural law is understood as an external rule, similar to the early Chomsky's universal grammar and universal language. Their major concern was to establish how rights could be validated in order to defend an interest. They derived the knowledge of rights from the truth validating character which they believed to be found in the process of argumentation. This could be recognized in argumentation because it was assumed that one cannot break basic rules in argumentation without ending the performance of argumenting itself, as for example by stepping aside and keeping silence. This worldview is clearly anthropocentric. We could imagine Hoppe's world in terms of Einstein's four-dimensional space-time cube, in which the human being, the subject, moves around freely and by which it is enclosed. Thus, any argumentation takes place on the ground of general, common standards of discourse, and the discourse partners simply apply those rules in an individual way through which truth is finally found. A transcendental covenant understands the person as an interrelated individual entity which is co-constituted with all the other persons as described by Lain and Tralgo. Natural law is the principle of liberty as universally unlimited potentiality, which is inherent in all persons, independent of their species, form or material appearance. The question is not so much how we know rights, because they are not assumed to exist by themselves, but how we constitute rights. The source for this constitutional process is the logical contradiction intrinsic in the existence of the person as a free, mindful, but at the same time limited material entity. This transcends in real life conflicts as encounter between persons, which leads to the stimulation of finding meaning and unity in a world which is experienced as broken. Through the creation of meaning, the universal of liberty is recognized and reenacted. The determination of rights is an example of such an adherence of meaning. This is based on a relational anthropology in which space, time and subjects depend on each other and are co-emergent. 
It relies strongly on the meaning-creating process as described by Alfred Schütz. The individual person is not longer independent from space-time. It shapes and it is shaped by it. Thus, the foundational framework of the whole world view and the consequent theory of rights is very much different, even though this is often neglected because such assumptions are very basic, invisible and normally largely agreed. That's what is meant by a synthetic geometry, the logical framework of the whole theoretical approach. I still do not understand why this co-emergent ontology of the person leads to a different understanding of rights. All right. There is an obligation which is logically implied in the co-constitution of personhood. Frankl described this as life's quest for meaning. It means since being a person is a, a priori a logical contradiction, including a noetic tension, in order to be and to go on being, which means perpetually becoming a person, it is required to create meaning to give a creative solution to the objective me meaninglessness of the world. The world, in, in scientific terms, uh, does not have any meaning. From this, we derive the obligation of a fourfold affirmation of self, other, world and ideal, which is intrinsically impossible to be accomplished, but yet has to be aspired. Despite of it, this is what Schweitzer defined as tragic optimism. In this context, rights lose completely their possibility to be a function for deciding on a third person's actions. What remains is only the measurements of one's own actions and the interpersonal negotiation of such. Let me conclude with a quotation of the Frankel scholar Paul Wong. Ultimately, it is not what we think or how we feel, but what we choose or what we do that shapes our lives and determines our destiny. This has concrete implications on our legal system. I see. We will discuss this in our next meeting. Thank you very much. That's all for today. Thank you, Graham. Bye.